Welcome, everybody. So thrilled to have you today. We have our fabulous speakers here, our Elite 200 community, and even uh, the whole applicant pool from the 2023 Cup, waiting and anticipating that the 2023 Elite 200 announcement, uh, which should come out in the next couple of weeks, uh, and then we'll announce publicly um, in early January. Thank you guys for sharing your time and energy with us this morning or evening, depending on where you are. As a little recap, the Startup Academy is focused on delivering highly specific, tailored and relevant content for the early stage ed tech community prior to the ASU GSV Summit. Once we're, once we're there in person, we'll focus more on relationship building and um, creating connections with each other and with investors and potential partners. The Startup Academy series will be dedicated to growth, product, people, and of course, we'll feature experts in these fields to provide specific insights based on their experience when they were in your shoes. With that said, I'm so pleased to kick off today's session focused on EdTech Without Borders. The session will be about 25 or 30 minutes of discussion and then 15 minutes or so of Q&A. So please get ready with some questions. To ask a question, please send it via Zoom chat into the, into the chat and, and we'll get it put into our queue. Um, we will also be recording this session and sending out that file. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, we have two super fantastic leaders here to speak with you today. We're so grateful to have them. Uh, Ravi Bhushan, the founder and CEO of Bright Champs, and Jennifer Lee, the Chief Growth Officer of Photomath. So without further ado, let's uh, bring our speakers out and, and get this thing going. Hey, Ravi. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, hi, Fran. Hey, Fran. Uh, super glad to be here. You know, excited to be talking about, uh, you know, our experience so far of growing the company across so many countries. Ditto. Thanks for having us here, and we're happy to share with the community. Thank you guys so much. I mean, just to start, maybe you all would would care to take a minute or two to introduce yourselves and, and your companies and what they do. Um, Jennifer, why don't you start and then we'll go to Ravi. Sounds good. Um, so hi, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm the Chief Growth Officer over at Photomath. Um, Photomath is the number one math learning app globally. We uh, use a mobile phone to help students um, take a picture of uh, their math problems and help them understand the how and the why um, and the approach. And, and for us, the goal is really to help students and the parents on their learning journey, specifically their math learning journey, and to help support them so that they too can always feel confident about math and that um, it's a skill set that they can conquer. Yep. Um, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Ravi. Bhushan, founder and CEO of brightchamps.com. Uh, Brightchamps is a platform which is uh, all about providing high quality education around uh, all those skills, important life skills, which are not part of the formal curriculum, but are very important in today's time to have a superlative outcome. Things like technology education, things like financial literacy, things like robotics, things like uh, you know communication, all these are very important skills. And uh, you know we, we cater to them. Uh, in the K-12 segment across 20 plus countries. Awesome. Thanks so much. So so to kick off the conversation, um, Ravi, we'll start with you and then go to Jennifer. Um, could you just walk us through where the company was originally founded, what the core markets were for the company at its earliest stages, and how those core markets have changed over time? Sure, absolutely, Fran. Um, you know, we started the company in August 2020, you know, and this was the peak of the pandemic, right? And uh, uh, the genesis of the company was basically a lot of my personal experience around the gap which uh, which uh, I was witnessing in the society, wherein a lot of people who were serious about their career, they were coming up and saying that, you know, provided we would have had this, uh, you know, knowledge around these important life skills, we would have also landed into a better outcome as far as our, uh, you know, uh, end result in life is concerned. And things like, you know, a lot of friends who were not from technology world, they were sort of, uh, you know, uh, echoing this uh, this uh, belief, you know, from their side that, uh, you know, lack of technology education during their foundational, uh, you know, education journey 
uh, is becoming a hindrance for them to not grow. And many of the people who were from technology world, you know, they were saying that, you know, lack of financial literacy was also becoming. So, so those kind of experiences led me to start this company. Uh, as I said that we are started in August 2020. And uh, uh, before starting the company, I actually talked to hundreds of parents, like more than 300 parents across different countries. And what I realized that this gap is not uh, country specific, this gap is a global gap. And that is why I decided that, you know, I should be building this company uh, with a global mindset from day one, right? And that is why even though I was based out of India, I started the operations, uh, you know, uh, from Middle East, uh, UAE being the first country, right? And then very soon we expanded to most of the countries in Middle East. And uh, and then after that, we expanded uh, our operations in Southeast Asia and then uh, uh, North America, right? So, and, 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 you know, we were right. We were absolutely right in terms of, you know, uh, uh, identifying the, the gap being global, which, whichever country we went, we realized that, you know, the gap is a real gap and there was a strong sort of, you know, tailwind as far as the need gap is concerned. And, you know, there was a strong product market fit, right? So we started expanding to, uh, to different countries and within 10 months, I remember, Within ten months of launch, we were we were present in more than fifteen countries uh, wow. with a very fantastic response. That's amazing. And just a point of clarification: the UAE was before selling product in India. Is that correct? Yeah, India. We started uh, quite late. Like our, we thought that you know if we take advantage of our native uh, you know sort of country, we may we may find it convenient. But, uh, you know, our mindset to build a global company for day one may get compromised. So so we said that, you know, let's take the challenge head on and then let's start with the, uh, you know, overseas operation. Right. And then uh, that is why we started with the uh, with outside India as the first uh, country to be launched. Awesome. Thanks so much for that answer. Jennifer, I'm kicking over pretty much the same question to you. You know, where was the company originally founded? What were its original core markets and kind of how has that changed over time? Yeah, very similar to Ravi. We felt, you know, focus in math, it was a global need. There's one and a half billion students in our age range, which we define as about fifth grade through college, that are literally mandated by their governments to study math year over year over year. It is one of those unique subjects that is really global in nature. So our company was founded out of Croatia, um, but so much Ravi, we decided to go kind of global from the beginning. Um, and I think within our first year, we had 80 plus countries. Uh, being a mobile platform, it's easier to kind of scale, move quickly to various different countries. Um, and today we support uh, the app in 30 plus languages and are present in over 200 countries. So um, we've kind of been global from day one. Um, the U.S. has always been a very big market for us, uh, but Russia, Indonesia, um, Thailand, Mexico and Brazil are also all large countries for us as well. Gotcha. Thanks so much for the answer. Um, next, we'll kind of turn uh, to talking about team a little bit. Um, so Jennifer, you know, starting with you, could you just walk the audience through, you know, where are most of your employees based and, and photo math and your opinion on how important it is to have employees in a local market? Yeah. So we right now have employees in, um, only three different countries. Um, the vast majority of our employees are still in Croatia today. Um, and for us, it really has been about where can we find the right talent um, and maybe the most competent talent, or sorry, not most competent, like biggest pool of talent for a particular given area, right? And so for us, what we have found when it comes to our engineering, our AI, actually Croatia is a fabulous market. Even though it's a small country, there's a lot of technical depth. And from a competitive standpoint, we can hire um, much easier in the US an AI engineer than we can hire, sorry, in Croatia, than we can hire like an AI engineer um, in the United States. But we also recognized as we were growing that to be able to serve our markets, um, certain of our target markets well, we also needed to have a, um, people who under kind of understood those markets. Um, similarly, there were certain functional areas, um, product was a good example of this, where the pool was not as deep in Croatia. And so we felt um, the need to go into the United States. Um, and then similarly, it was just a question of like, where do we find good talent um, and the kind of greatest depth of talent. And that's where we have uh, expanded our team. 
A hundred percent makes sense. Um, Ravi, can I kick the same question over to you? Yeah, of course, sir. So when we started our, uh, you know, talent pool was mostly from India. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if you want to just enter into the country and, uh, uh, you know, try it out and, you know, understand the, the PMF piece, product market fit thing, um, you know, you can do it from anywhere. But when you want to go to the deeper uh, level of, you know, market penetration, I think, you know, you need to get into the nuances of culture and, uh, you know, language and, uh, you know, localization becomes very important. Like, for example, um, when we entered into Southeast Asia, um, more than 80% of the people there are comfortable with Bahasa language, right? Initially, when we were serving the content, when we were, when we were serving the experience only in English, uh, for the initial few months, it was fine. But then we realized that, you know, if you want to really go, go deep into the country and become number one player in that particular uh, region, it's very important that, you know, we localize things as per the country need, right? So that, you know, ch the experience of the child is superlative. And that is where I think, you know, that is the time when you need to, uh, you need to hire the talent locally so that, you know, they become the bridge between the local need and the, and the global product which you have built. And, and, you know, they make it more suitable for that particular country. So I, I think wherever we went, most of the strategic uh, location, initial six months, we didn't hire. But right now we have present, uh, we have presence of talent in more than six uh, countries. So we, we take the approach like, you know, Southeast Asia as a region. And, uh, you know, there are group of nations who, who are very culturally similar. And we, we ensure that, you know, we have talent representation from that particular group of nation. So that, uh, you know, we understand that, you know, market need very clearly. And it, that's the approach of hiring talent in different, different, uh, you know, countries. Got you. And that's a perfect uh, segue into uh, an, our next question, which is all about localization strategy. <laughs> um, and, and I guess we're wondering, you know, and we hear from our entrepreneurs is like, how do you think about forming a localization strategy when you enter into a new market? You know, what are those critical aspects that you're analyzing from pricing to marketing to language to culture? And, and, and of course, you know, why it's so important. And, and I loved your answer, Ravi, you know, having a specific story. Um, and so Jennifer, maybe we could start with you. Um, if you could kind of walk us through how you guys thought about that at Photomath and maybe share you know, a tangible example of, of some localization work, you know, your team has done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, like every startup, um, you start one way and you start reading, you start seeing what data you can collect and that starts informing. So, you know, how informed was our localization strategy at the very beginning and that first year? You know, I think what we found was, look, the, the market clearly showed us this is a global need. And so then for us, it became a question around how do we provide this at scale globally? And when it comes to, you know, trying to tackle 80, 100 plus countries, you just have to be realistic about the degree of localization that is possible, right? Um, and we we even recognize that, you know, people say math is like, a, is like love, right? It's like a universal language. But just like love, there's different value sets and um, people approach and learn math differently. And so for us, it's even been a question of like, how do we teach math locally? Um, and what one of the things we try to do is there are some basic product and product tenants that we hold um, across. And for the most part, actually, we actually try to keep the product um, as homogenous as possible and localize the various different languages because of the scale complexity of it. What we find for us as a digital product in particular, I'm not, you know, I'm sure it's a, a different case when you're talking about different models here, but as a digital product, for us, the localization really comes around what's the payment methodology, right? Like what are the payment platforms? What's the structure of payment models? There are things that work well. Subscription businesses work really well in the United States, not as common um, in certain other markets whereby people use a lot of prepaid methodologies or pay as you go methodologies, particularly Southeast Asia and Latin. So I, I would have to say most of our localization comes in around payment models and then um, marketing, which in which case, you know, as, as kind of Ravi indicated, it's a question about whether or not you want to build out that, that expertise internally or whether or not it makes sense um, to outsource through consultants and agencies, right? So if you're trying to move quickly, 
um, and build up something and test a market, it tends to make sense to do outsourcing agencies. If you're trying to buy, you know, local lists, agencies, local knowledge, that kind of stuff. Um, or if it's not necessarily critical that you have that expertise in house, that's also where we tend to use local agencies and um, consultants. Gotcha. That makes a whole ton of sense to me. And, and Ravi, you kind of started to answer the question already. Um, but is there anything you wanted to add about, you know, Bright Champs localization strategy? I think everyone's really curious to kind of learn, you know, from a framework's perspective, you know, what's top of mind, you know, when you're entering a new market, you know, what are you looking at? Stuff like that. Yeah, there, there's so many things when it comes to localization. And if you do it right, it gives you a very significant advantage compared to many others who are competing with you in that market. And, uh, you know, high level, uh, you know, the way country pays like pricing customization, bundling customization, content customization, culture customization, right? And 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 then also about, uh, you know, there are some country like, for example, we are in, in modern life skill space, right? For K-12 segment. There are countries in which, uh, for example, coding or technology, is part of the formal curriculum in a school, right? There are countries wherein it is not part of the school curriculum, right? Now you need to, the, you know, and these two types of country, the aspiration of the children are very different. I'll give you a very, very tangible sort of, you know, sort of story. When we launched our financial literacy course uh, in Mid Middle East, um, you know, it was, a, it was a big hit, right? And, uh, uh, and after a few months, we realized that uh, in many of these nations, uh, there is something called Sharia law, right, which is uh, through which, uh, you know, there are some tweaks in their financial, uh, you know, uh, dealing, right, and that's uh, sort of, uh, you know, very prominent, uh, prominently present in those countries, right, so what we did that, we, we re, uh, redid our entire financial literacy course uh, as if uh, to make it Sharia compliant, right, and, wow. and, uh, and we were the only one doing it, right? You know, so think about many of these countries where in Sharia, uh, financial awareness is a very important factor in society, right? If you don't do it, right, people, people may perceive you that, you know, you are teaching probably the wrong concept. Globally, you may look like that, you know, you are doing right. But, uh, but it's very important that, you know, you, you adhere to the cultural nuances, to, to the country specific nuances, right? Very a small example in grade two, there was a there was a project in our coding uh, thing wherein you had to animate uh, an animal, and then we were teaching in India. You know the animal was the national and uh, you know animal of India, which is tiger. And when we went to Saudi Arabia, you know the teacher started uh, you know teaching that you know national animal of uh, you know country tiger, which was a complete miss, right? You know it is camel. So what I'm trying to say is that you know the small small things you have to you have to make sure that uh, you know they are uh, they are tweaked and customized as per the country need right but it's a journey i think you know you need to make a checklist and make sure that you don't do uh, you know big mistake and then once you get into the country the market teaches you a lot many things the framework is that you know you do a hygiene check and you know go with that preparation and within two three years you know you just reevaluate the entire experience basis the country need Got you. That that makes so much sense. I love that story. Um, I wonder if it's harder to uh, animate a camel or a tiger, uh, but we'll have to look at the data for that another time. Um, so I guess now kind of on the flip side and, and Jennifer, you kind of already started talking about this concept, um, which is that, you know, products have core identities and companies have core cultures. And we're kind of wondering, and we hear from entrepreneurs a lot, like when you're engaging in localization, how do you ensure local teams or product teams focused on local markets uh, know what can be tweaked, but no has to remain the same when we're expanding into new markets and iterating? And Jennifer, you kind of mentioned, you know, on the photo math side, things are quite standardized other than language. But I'm wondering, you know, how you sort of communicate that to your teams and if they do have any leeway how much do they have to sort of customize um, and then Ravi will come to you with sort of a similar question um, with bright chance yeah I think it, it depends on what area we're talking about so when it comes to product actually um, that is a kind of that is the definition of the entire experience so that is all internal and it is managed um, by a 
central team, the product experience um, in every single country. And they look at it and they think about it and they say, hey, you know, we notice that in this particular country, this subject, like this explanation works really well. It has a 80% approval helpfulness rating in this other country too. It's only got a 20% helpfulness rating, right? And so then they can think globally and holistically, how do we think about the how different content relates to the specific uh, product experience, but also at the same time, we want to make sure that the core benefits of photo math, right, which is helping students start to understand a problem and be able to get help every single time that that is thought about consistently market between market and market. So all that kind of stuff, we don't, as, as product is managed from a global team, um, it is, you know, something that's very easy for us to maintain control over. Um, I think the key question really becomes around marketing and how much um, localization happens that way for us. Um, and then our documentation, you know, is key. Um, and that's true for us as a, you know, we talked about this from the very beginning, yeah. having a spread out team, having, you know, um, users, or sorry, employees in, in two different countries or now three different countries, even still with the time difference that we have between the United States and Croatia, documentation has always been critical to our success as an organization. And that's also critical to our success in maintaining certain brand tenants, brand values, and being very clear about that, particularly when we're starting to use outside agencies. A hundred percent. Particularly when we start using TikTok influencers as well. Totally. And, and if I may ask a follow-up question, like I'm sure a lot of the early stage founders would love to kind of dive a little bit deeper into what you mean when you say documentation and how you sort of like roll that out to these agencies or to your local marketing teams? Are there any little tidbits or best practices uh, you'd be willing to share on lessons learned from from doing that, you know, so many times? Yeah, I think <laughs> it, it sounds rather simplistic and like the obvious, but usually sometimes those are the best things. So um, okay. really being clear on your mission and vision right? Like having a very solidified mission and vision statement. And then what is the values that you are trying? What is like the value proposition um, to your to your end users? And when we talk about this, like agencies are actually fairly, you know, this is their job, right? Making sure they understand what is the client want and adhering to the plan. For us, what's been interesting is like, as you think about, as I mentioned before, people like TikTok influencers or TikTok uh, things, campaigns, um, you want to allow a lot of creativity because, that's a platform where the individual creativity drives success on things, but you want to make sure that they're not then just going into certain topics or certain subjects that we don't, we don't support or we don't want to be associated with. And so there it's just being explicitly clear, but, but very minimal, right? So like here are four things we want you to stay away from after that, you know, we, we try to give us a lot, a lot of leeway, and then we have a mechanism for escalation very quickly. So there's a review process. And then the person internally can say, hey, does this violate any of those four? If not, good to go. Um, if it's questionable, you know, escalate one level up, but that becomes a small percentage of the time. So we can still move really quickly. That's super helpful. Thanks for the answer. Ravi, I'll, I'll flip it back to you. You know, obviously you guys do a bit more on the customization front, you know, product wise. Um, it'd be really great to kind of learn from you on tactics you use to sort of, you know, make sure the Bright Champs brand is, you know, serving, you know, has the same identity across markets. Yep. You know, the one, one thing which we have done is um, in whichever country we go, whatever customization we do, there is a central theme around what do we want to achieve by that particular experience with the child, right? So, so there is a child journey. And we expect certain tangible outcome at each and every stage of the journey, right? And we ensure that, you know, that is not compromised irrespective of whatever customization we are doing in that country, right? That's one. So, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, we can, we can change the name of the, the character or animal or the story and, and, you know, some of the, some of the, you know, some of the tweaking as per the culture of the country, but the core and the central theme of the curriculum and the experience remains very, very intact, right? So there are there are certain central areas wherein the customization is not left to the local teams. 
right? And that particular central theme is managed by the central team, right? And there are such certain, you know, peripheral things wherein you need to make it more suitable for that, you know, country taste and culture. That particular thing is allowed, right? How do you make sure that, you know, this is implemented properly? So whatever customization happened by the, is, is recommended by the local team, they basically come for the review by the central team. It take a little bit of, you know, it in, injects a little bit of delay in the overall execution cycle, but it's worth it because you don't want to do a mistake and you are dealing with children and uh, you know you want to make sure that you know the central theme center central journey piece and the tangible outcome at different stages of the journey that is particularly inta intact uh, irrespective of whichever country you are launching the second thing is which uh, uh, jenny talked about uh, the the marketing and you know some of the messaging you know tweaks right i think their local team presence is much more important they they exactly know what kind of channel, what kind of communication, what kind of messages will work. But then there also we have thematic idea. We we define uh, thematic communication wherein that wherein we say that you know these are the do to dos, these these are the dos and these are the don'ts as far as uh, you know the brand communication is concerned, right? So even if something is working as far as the acquisition of the user is concerned, we don't want to go there if this is violating our you know uh, checklist. Uh, uh you know which we have prepared for the for the uh, for the teams in the in, in the local country right so i think review mechanism and making sure that you know central theme is not comp compromised right you know these are the two things which really work in our favor got you that's that's super helpful thank you so much um i think we have time for like two more questions and then we'll open it up to q a um the tech folks have instructed me though Everyone, make sure to enter your questions through the Q and A function um, in the chat versus the versus the general. Um, Ravi, we'll kind of come back to you first, and then we'll go to Jennifer. Um, obviously, you know, Bright Champs' growth across countries has been amazing, but you did mention the UAE was sort of your first market, and I think that the audience will be curious, like, how did you go about determining? Um, which market would be your first and how did you end up choosing the UAE? Like what were the metrics you were looking for, the strategy to, to make that choice, stuff like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, uh, very important decision when you are just launching the company, right? Yep. Uh, uh, it was a mix of a few of the experiments we did and, uh, uh, and certain convenience factors. Uh, for example, uh, I talked to more than 300 parents in different countries. We run, ran a simple ad experiment and, you know, we captured some of the interest and I started talking personally to all those parents. And I tried to get a sense that what kind of curiosities they have as far as their child learning in this particular space is concerned, which is not academic, which is more co-curricular, right? And then we wanted to build a global ed tech company, which is, which is more towards um uh, tangible outcome more towards uh, the learning outcome uh, so we wanted to focus more on delivery rather than acquisition so wherever we realize that you know the parent is more uh, parent questions are more around fomo dream and you know discounting right we sort of said that you know let's avoid this region as of now wherever the where where they were wherever it was more towards uh, questions around what my child will learn how will you teach what will be the learning outcome? Those kind of questions. We said that you know, let's stick to these uh, particular countries. Why? Why I? Why I did that differentiation? I simply felt that if I don't set the initial DNA of the company in the right way, right, it will be very difficult for me to change that particular DNA later on in the journey, right. So it's it's important for a high quality tech company to set the tone of the organization and I, I i i based on my personal experience i know that there are so many companies who are very good in acquisition but then but then they have not been so very uh, focused on the delivery side so we said that you know let's let's take this particular opportunity and uh, you know convert that, that in our favor and the second thing was that when when i talked to those 300 parents right it was very clear that the globe the need is global but at the same time, we have we are a very small team with a very limited sort of you know bandwidth as far as the execution capability is concerned. So we we also added two factor. One was the time zone convenience, which is like the most of the team was based in India. So we didn't want to start the operation wherein it's like you know 
10 hours or 12 hours wow. sort of difference right and and second was that you know we wanted to enter into a country wherein we can ourselves understand the customer uh, you know responses if we enter let's say if we enter if we would have entered into japan right uh, most of our team uh, might not be able to converse it with the with the parents right uh, so we said that you know let's enter into a country which is which has a strong tailwind as far as the product need is concerned second is it should be time zone convenient and it should be language convenient right and uae sort of you know was well placed like you know it was two hour uh, you know sort of uh, time zone difference i know it's what it was convenient and you know we also realized that there is a strong sort of product uh, need so there was a strong tailwind so combining all these factors i i sort of uh, launched in uae but it was just a uh, you know a small period we very soon realized that you know there are referrals coming from other adjacent countries so within three months we sort of launched to almost all the mina, MENA region right so yeah but the initial decision was based on these three factors thank you that's that's so helpful um and and jennifer kind of in a similar vein but a little bit differently uh because obviously photo math was quite broad from the start I went into the App Store data on Sensor Tower and PhotoMath in 2015 had active users in 80 countries. Um, so like, could you walk us through how PhotoMath, you know, strategized and executed on the launch of the app? You know, like what were the difficulties that the team faced? You know, was it tough to have a presence in so many countries from the start or was it a benefit? I know you, I think, started in 2017. Uh, but um, hopefully you have some light to shed on on the topic. Yeah, for sure. Um, as you mentioned, right when we when you launch in the app store, you really can't control where it goes and where it gets adopted. And so, I think for us, it really just became a question of where was where was adoption initially, um, and where was there kind of a more natural product market fit between what the current product state was and how kids studied math in that particular country. Um, I think one of the things that was also really helpful for us um, when we actually launched in the App Store, ironically enough, was to have uh, a media kit on our website. And it was a media kit that was really focused on visual images. Um, it helps that PhotoMath itself is like a very visual tool, right? Like once you, you you see it in action, you're like, oh, I get it. And what that enabled us to do was that when we launched, we found actually all these uh, journalists were coming in at the time. We were the first ones to do the OCR technology, the ability to scan on the screen and interpret it. And so just having like the visual media kit meant that a reporter from Japan could easily go in and write an interesting story on it, as could a reporter from Germany and a reporter from the United States without ever having to kind of contact us. So we got a lot of earned media that way um, that was extremely helpful. So it was like kind of content that could be used globally. And then from there, it became a really tricky question about how to, you know, do we continue to just grow and build and try to build the entire product every single time for every single language, you know, that was available. We actually were more than 30 plus languages at one point, And we ended up scaling down a little bit from a, a perspective of how much added value, how many added users and the maintenance cost and the translation cost and all that. Um, so there was kind of a, you know, we went a little further and we scaled back down a little bit point. Um, but I think as we have grown and matured as an organization, and particularly once we introduced revenue, <laughs> being a free product uh, is very different than when you also have a monetizable product involved. Once we introduced the monetization product, um, that also really started helping us focus in terms of like identifying where our key target markets. Um, and then we do have some difference of product build now in certain markets where we will lead with one see how it performs, really kind of work out certain kinks, then take that and start figuring out how to globalize it or, or localize it either in different languages and whatnot. And depending on the complexity of that um, product, be it how much of it is software driven versus um, has like a human component to it, then, you know, that changes how we localize and, and think. But um, as a whole, I think for us, it was very data first, right? And then as... Um, particularly as you start monetizing, then you just need to start focusing, particularly because you need to focus your marketing spend. A hundred percent. And thank you so much for the answer. Um, I think we can turn to some audience Q&A now. Um, 
we've got a number of questions in about pricing of product and also uh, across markets and then also salary of employees across markets. But let's start with pricing. Um, someone is curious to understand approach towards pricing as you scaled. Specifically, did you price in local currencies or in dollars? And if in dollars, was that a barrier to adoption? Um, Ravi, maybe we could start with you and then go to Jennifer. Yeah, of course. There is no single, um, you know, size fits all sort of formula. It depends upon the country. Uh, there are some countries where, who are completely not comfortable paying you in any other currency apart from their local currency, right? Um, wherever we launched, as far as Brightchamps experience is concerned, we sort of kick started with the dollar pricing, right? But then we realized that, you know, if you really want to go deep into the market, it's very important that, you know, we provide them more payment solution, right? And and so and that, so that's one, which is providing uh, facility in the local currency uh, for paying. The second one is also about the pay, paying uh, habit of that country, right? Some in as far as education is concerned, in some of the countries, it is a, it is it is more convenient or more uh, uh, you know normal for parent to pay on a monthly subscription basis. Where in certain countries they say that you know I'll buy the entire course and I can pay you in two three part payments or full one time, right? So, so what you need to understand is that, you know, what's the, what's the payment habit of that particular country? And then basis that, you know, you need to tweak your uh, payment option. Some countries are very, very comfortable with BNPL. Uh, some countries are not at all comfortable, right? Some people, some countries are very comfortable with the monthly subscription, uh, while some other country will be okay to pay full, full amount upfront, right? So, so as and when, like it takes three to six months uh, uh, to to get into the those specific nuances. But once you have those, uh, yeah, it's better to provide those options because otherwise you are leaving money on the table. Got you. And Jennifer, anything to add on um, pricing in local markets? Yeah. So we uh, took approach of um, one, one learning from other people. So we looked at two di like two different things when we look at uh, different uh, different countries. One, what does Netflix charge? <laughs> and two, what's the Big Mac? We, we call it the Big Mac index, right? How much does a Big Mac cost in that country um, as reference points for how we want to think about pricing? And what we actually found was that um, you can kind of group countries into uh, sets, right? Like as a small team trying to you, once you go on the app store, you can monetize, you know, in every single country you're available. And um, for us, it was uh, at least any given particular language um, was starting to kind of like bunch and tier countries uh, for simplicity reasons, right? And also how much added benefit do you really get for optimizing the price in <laughs> every single, you know, LATAM country type situation. Um, so we kind of look at what is their GDP capita? Where do they stand on this Netflix? Where do they stand on the Big Mac index? And then kind of group accordingly. Um, and then I, I kind of would agree for Ravi, probably actually the greater influencer is not necessarily the pricing as it is the packaging. Um, and the and the structure of the payment models is probably maybe a bigger uh, overall influencer than the actual like, are you setting prices locally and how much um, specification per per given country on the price itself? Got you. That's, that's super helpful. And I think we could touch on the next question very, very quickly. Um, but I do want to get it asked, which is like, do you, you know, provide different salaries for employees in different countries? Um, and if so, why? I think um, the answer will be yes. Uh, but I just, you know, I think people are curious to know your perspective on it, you know, really quick. And, and Jen, maybe you could start and, and then go to Robbie. Yeah, we do. We we adjust based off of um, what the cost of living is. And we actually even do it um, domestically within the United States. So we also adjust prices. And I think that has to like it has to agree with the overall. It's hard to justify that we don't that we do it for us versus Croatia, us versus UK um, yeah. or US and then not even do it within the US as well. You know, so um, we we just we adjust because it is a different cost of living. 
yep. for um, people. And so what we want to do is to make sure that we're competitive with the local market and that we're providing people um, comfortable salaries to be able to achieve a, you know, a, a lifestyle that um, is commensurate with their desires. And so that is very different in Croatia than it is in Silicon Valley. 100%. And, and Ravi, I'll assume your answer is, the, is very similar. Um, and maybe we can move on to the next topic here in the interest of time. Um, and Ravi, yeah. this question from the audience is specifically for you. And it's about the market research you did when you were interviewing the 300 parents. And the audience is wondering, what about the end user, the kids? What did you do to kind of understand their needs and gauge their interest and stuff like that? And kind of like, obviously, the parents are the ones buying. Um, but how do you see, you know, measure success and, and academic outcomes and stuff like that? Yep, that's a very good question. Um, in K-12 is a very interesting market, you know, uh, parents are the customer and kids are the users, right? And you need to understand uh, needs and aspirations of both uh, both these uh, entities, right? Uh, initially, when we talked to the parent, it was because it was very convenient. You know, if you go to a grade two student and uh, you are start asking those serious questions, you know, he or she may not be able to articulate it well, right? It's almost like, you know, when you take a small baby to to a doctor right you know doctor has to figure out that you know what the, where the pain is ra rather than expecting the baby to articulate it well that you know my pain is here right so so what i'm trying to say is that you know k12 uh, gives you those challenges right so we found that you know uh, for the younger kids which is in k5 it's it's more important that you know we understand what how parent are uh, thinking of right but uh, in the in the senior kids, which is uh, grade six to twelve, I know we were very comfortable and we were very very conveniently able to talk to the to the kids as well, and and uh, understand that you know what they are looking forward to, right? Ultimately, what I what I realized that you know, uh, most of the most of the students or kids are very excited about all these modern things, right? They really want to understand how cryptocurrency work. They really want to understand how coding works, right? How computer works, right? So these are these are all all the things which we are providing. They are very, uh, very playful, very engaging, and very aspirational in nature, right? So for kids, it's very attractive, right? Uh, so so one thing was very clear that you know the engagement will be very very high if we if we do a good job as far as the experience in the class is concerned. The, the major concern is with the parent wherein they are looking forward to that because most of them are like more than 90% of them are not aware what what does financial literacy mean for kids, right? Yeah. So or, or, or what 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 why do we do technology education as you know to, to their children at as such a at, a at a small age, right? So what I'm trying to say is that you know the, the more serious or more important questions were there in the mind of parent. Because we were very, very, very sure that you know kids will engage, kids will love, kids will you know, enjoy the learning, uh, you know, experience, right? Yeah. So whether this will this will lead to some tangible outcome, whether this will help them when they become adult, uh, whether this is going to help them get into a better career, all those questions we are in the mind of parent, right? And and that that was the core, uh, you know, portion of our research, right? Uh, if just just adding to one one approach was of course doing surveys and talking to these parents, uh, you know, um, directly. But then the other thing we also did is that, you know, we sort of uh, spent some budget, ran some ad, created some variations of landing pages, just to understand that between two types of options, what uh, what is the natural selection of the parent, right? And then we realized that, you know, the top of mind, you know, aspiration, which is sitting in the, in the mind of the parent is around option B or option A. And that sort of, you know, such kind of, you know, experiments in different permutation and combination helped us understand that, you know, this is the path. This is the, these are the top three things uh, in their mind. And they are naturally inclined, more, majority of the population is more inclined towards such a thing, right? So that was another way of, you know, researching the market, right? And of course, when you start teaching, you know, because you are engaging with the child uh, almost uh, more than an hour, uh, almost, uh, you know, almost seven, eight hours every, every month. So, so that gives you a lot of opportunity. Then you start carving, then you start figuring out that, you know, what is working, what is not working, right? Because then you can inject many of the experiments in the classroom experience itself, right? 
So, so we started with survey and talking to the parent, but then we also did ads and landing pages experiment. And then when you started the classes, when we started the operation, within the classroom, multiple experiments ran, right? I think, you know, it's a, of course, the theme was intact, the vision was intact, right? But it was also an outcome of, the journey was an outcome of so many small AB experiments, uh, you know, at various stages. And that ultimately led to under, led us to understand a little bit more about, you know, what their need is. Got you. Thank you so much for the answer. And unfortunately, we are kind of at time here. So we did have, you know, a couple other questions from the audience, but um, I think we we covered a lot today. And thank you guys so much for taking the time um, and bringing your energy and insights uh, to the conversation. Um, before we log off, you know, Jen, Ravi, any last, you know, closing comments for budding ed tech entrepreneurs thinking about building an ed tech company without borders? Uh, that we kind of haven't covered. Uh, Jen, maybe a 30 second riff and then uh, we can go to Ravi and close. There's a lot. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say, look, I, I'm like with Ravi, I think what we really care about is seeing progression and how people learn and the positive impact of education. And on that front, like I am more than happy to help the community at large. So if there are questions that you have, please feel free to follow up directly. I'm happy to, you know, uh, GSV team has my contact information and you are welcome to to share it with anybody um, on the call who wants to follow up and speak directly. And I'm, I'm happy to have further in-depth conversations um, offline. That's so generous. Thank you so much for that offer. Yep. I, I, I think um, to, to that particular question, uh, Francis, uh, it's an incredible time to build a high quality ed tech company right now, right? There was a time when everything was nitro boosted during the, the during the pandemic period, right? Uh, high quality company will emerge really in this particular period, right? There are so many white spaces in the ed tech space and, and at, a, at a global level, right? You know, unfortunately, the world is changing very, very fast. Unfortunately, the education, the core education or the conventional education is not evolving with the same speed. So the gap is widening. And there are various types of opportunities to, to fill that particular gap, right? I, I suggest to all the body entrepreneurs that, you know, identify a core need, focus on the delivery, focus on real outcome of the child or, or the student, right? And I think in the long run, people who care about quality will win. Thank you so much, Ravi and Jennifer. And, and thank you to our audience for joining. Once again, we will be emailing everyone with their results in the next week or two and then going live with the 200 list to the public in early January. Look out for our next uh, webinar invitation as well. And, and thanks again, everybody, and have an awesome day. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye.